I think we should open this up for the uh, panel discussion. You can, uh, you can join us here. Um, I want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, so I will not ask any questions, but give you two thoughts uh, you could uh, think about while the others are raising their hands. Um, the first one is, yeah, you can then, you can then respond. Is there, uh, let, let's collect a few questions. We have 15 minutes uh, left, so I think we should collect a few questions and then have each of you uh, give a response. The first direction from my side is, is there a US bias in our, in our discussion? Because most of the presentations focus a lot on the US. Second thought, what about real estate prices and housing? Very absent from the discussion, although a key driver in explaining inequalities and explaining perhaps also wage dynamics. Third factor, and the only one who raised it in the, in the last presentation was Michael, is institutions, wage bargaining institutions, for example. Um, we just heard that you shock them in a Nash equilibrium uh, or in a, in a Nash bargaining context, but obviously the institutions matter a lot and uh, we need to look at Wendy Carlin and uh, uh, David Soskis uh, and other people for their work. So I think we should take three questions, go to the panel. You can then react also to each other. I will monitor you very carefully. If we can, a second round of questions, and then we conclude. Please, pl please introduce your, uh, yourselves. Um, do we have the mic? Mic's gone. Perhaps you could just give the, give the mic now to the, to the, to the people. And please, the, please briefly introduce yourself. Yeah. Thank you, um, uh, Peter Jungen. Um, I have three points to make. Uh, it sounds to me that um, a lot of this empirical work says much about uh, correlation and less about causation. Um, I hope I got this right. Um, the second point, um, it is true that in most of the uh, industrialized countries, but also in the emerging markets, we have a lot of inequality, within country inequality. But there is a lot of work, uh, Xavier de Sala, for instance, about reduction of um, between countries um, inequality in the process. Maybe you could comment on, on that. And the third, um, one of you made a remark about uh, EPL, um, employment protection laws in uh, Europe. Uh, if you look on the work from Tito Berry, uh, he can see the opposite uh, results, that the higher the EPL is, uh, the less is uh, lesser in employment rates in Europe and the other way around. And my last question is, why is it that in some industrialized countries you have the problem which you, uh, in, in your last presentation, um, showed on saving rates uh, differential that you have it in the United States? and not like in a country as uh, Germany is. And it struck me in my last remark, um, why are we not discussing the, the real causation of uh, what we see is that we have enlarged the competition in the world between employees, between workers, and we have less qualified people in industrialized country now competing more with qualified people in emerging markets and isn't this the real cause of the fact that we feel a, an increased inequality in industrialized countries and is there really something we can do about with all this we learned or isn't the key uh, a lack of education and that we have to invest much more in terms of education and in spite of a lot of other issues involved thanks okay we had a question uh, Sebastian Dulin in the back Uh, Sebastian Durin, HDW Berlin and European Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, Peter and Michael, I found your two presentations fascinating and I don't think they contradict each other the way you, you, you showed it. Um, because I think you can reconcile the story you made for, for um, the US and the German case. Uh, on, on, the, on the credit market you have the supply and the demand side and maybe in Germany we don't have a repressed uh, financial sector in the way that you cannot invest, but we have a highly regulated, both by institutions, traditions, but also by regulation, uh, way how you, get, how you can borrow. Uh, for a long time, it was not possible to, to get a mortgage uh, if you didn't have a down payment of at least 40% of the capital. Uh, still, up to today, uh, the Fundbriefe, uh, you have certain standards, and so the institutions actually are in a way that, uh, that, that they are biased against private sector credit. So if you take that into account, I think the two things could, could go together. You could say, well, you have the redistribution in Germany towards the richer part. Uh, they couldn't, um, well, 
recycle their funds to the private sector, to the lower 95% in Germany, so they had to, to land it abroad, and they did that to Spain and to the US and so on. And so I think they are complementaries, and I, I just think they are very fascinating, the things you have been presenting. Thank you. Okay. Uh, a third question, please here. Yeah. I gotta say, look, the Rajan business about uh, it was done for the benefit of the American lower classes is a satire on the human race. It's just absurd to picture Ronald Reagan and Alan Greenspan doing financial deregulation because they really wanted to help the American blue collar workers. They were trying to de-unionize uh, and weaken as far as possible. At some point, somebody has to deal with the real story. And I thought there's all of these presentations were quite interesting, and there's a bit, but but fitting them to the actual institutional facts, the numbers that folks run by, and the ins is sometimes uh, not easily uh, consonant with what I heard. But the story that's crazy is stories that people were really trying to help blue collar workers make up their while they, to make up the decline in consumption that they were right then causing. That's like devoid of any contact with reality. You get two minutes each to briefly react to each other and to all of those questions, and then we take other questions. I start and monitor. Okay, okay so I will be short. I think if, if I take Michael's paper and my paper, the question is who is the odd man out? Is the United States the exception, or is Germany the exception? So what, what is the rule? And um, well, if I looked at the data from 95 to 2005, I could see that in countries where inequality has gone down, had also this huge housing boom, like Ireland, like, like Spain. And so that's, I, I like the story that you made and I presented it before, I had presented this uh, talk here, then I realized it does not really fit. Yeah, so that's, it's, it's not only that Germany has a surplus, but also that, that Ireland and, and Spain, we, which improved, uh, which had a, had a more equal income distribution, had, had the same housing problems like, like the US. And, and so maybe the US is the exception, and an exception in the case that they had this subprime lending, which allowed people to borrow, which in other countries would not be able to borrow. So that was a temporary exception, and, and maybe so that's this US uh, case that, of course, is, is a good story, but it's probably not, it's, it's, that's the exception and, and not the rule. And so I, the, the rule is maybe that you have the other effect, that savings go up, that current account uh, does not deteriorate, but improve. So. Well, um, the, we control uh, for all sorts of variables in our, in our uh, regression analysis, it was very, I mean, uh, somebody mentioned the point correlation versus causation in the empirical work. That was very carefully done um, by people who know what they're doing, not me. Um, this was my co-authors. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, so I, I, I know that um, I think Germany, the, the, the thing is, at the end of the day, you have- Spain and Ireland, it's not only Germany, and, and the Scandinavian countries on the positive side, but there's also Ireland and Spain on the other side, which completely contradicts what, what you say. Uh, the story that we have uh, holds up for all the countries in our sample. And one thing that's different between what you did and what we did is what measure of income inequality we use. And perhaps that has something to do with it. I, you use Gini, we use the top 5% income share. That's something to look into, I don't know, okay? Uh, real estate, housing, um, uh, we didn't, we first of all, we set out to write a very simple model and so we wanted to leave all that collateral business out. I also don't think it's very important because the question is which way does causation run? Does it run from increased credit to higher housing prices or from higher housing prices to increased credit? And if you have a story where you think there was an increase in fundamental housing prices and that's why people could borrow against that and so everything was actually cool, then that's fine. But if the other story is true, that house prices only went up because credit went up and as soon as credit dried up, housing prices had to crash, then that story really doesn't make any sense. You shouldn't really think about housing in that case. Of course, it, it adds an interesting dimension to the story, but it is not fundamental and that's why we left it out because there are several studies out in the literature now, which shows that the causation did go from credit to house prices and not the other way around, at least in the US. Um, the, 
the reduction of in-between country inequality is something that's, that's Milan, uh, Milanovic's work. I don't find that very interesting. I think, uh, I, you know, it's not uninteresting, but I, I think the, the interesting questions are at the national level where you can do something about them. And, and, and that's what I want to worry about. Um, uh, why is it not happening in Germany? We, well, we sort of we sort of discussed that. I mean, my our theory is not written in stone that this is a theory for all countries at all times. It, you, for 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 every country, you have to think uh, what is what is really the structure of the financial markets. And I think the point that you made. Uh, um, uh, about Germany that there are some structural features whereby even though the financial markets exist, there was something in their, in their makeup and also in people's preferences that didn't make them borrow to the same extent as in other countries, would have to be separately more, uh, modeled in order to, to uh, do justice to it. Um, the last point uh, the, isn't the real uh, explanation higher. Uh, uh, um, it's basically a skill bias technological change story. Uh, I don't buy that for a minute. I mean, there are lots of uh, lots of stories out there where people have done empirical work. And skill bias technological change is always part of the picture, but people have looked at lots of other things, including uh, unionization, including offshoring, including uh, political things. And I, I find the book by Hacker and Pearson for the US very pers uh, persuasive, which basically says it was the politicians that screwed with the bottom 95% because uh, they, got, they got their money from the top 5%. Uh, and also offshoring, Offshoring is a policy decision. I, know, I believe that offshoring has something to do with workers losing bargaining power, but it is not a law of nature that you have to let your firms offshore. It's a policy decision, and it's not even something that is necessarily in the interest of the country to do offshoring, because if you read the book by Baumol and Gomery, uh, uh, that, that kind of thing is really only uh, something, uh, if you have increasing returns to scale, it's not necessarily a good thing uh, uh, to, to let your industries go uh, uh, to other countries. And so uh, it's a policy decision. Uh, okay, thank you. So just very quickly to take up a few strands, um, to respond to your questions first, is there a US bias in my paper? Yes, it's all only about the US. So um, there are other interesting uh, things. In terms of uh, the real estate that's very much captured in, in leverage questions. So I think a lot is, is already um, there, in, at least in, in, in the paper that I presented. I'd like to kind of take up a little bit on the questions that uh, Peter Jungen asked. And I think um, a couple of things. Um, you, the papers you said are about correlation, not causation. And uh, sure, yes. But I think there are so many stories that have been said, told. And I think compelling stories, not necessarily using an econometric methodology, but ask, telling stories about actually what happened in the world, which is very consistent with what we are finding here, right? At least what my paper is finding. Um, to respond a little bit to what you said, is not, are institutions and those things not important? I think maybe I didn't make it clear enough. I think that was the most important thing that happened in the 1980s. I mean, I, I tried to foreground that question. I'm not sure it was only wage bargaining, or wage bargaining was, uh, I, I certainly was part of the story, but I think most importantly, um, to echo something that Tom Ferguson, Ferguson said, um, it is the financial sector and the, the changes in the financial sector which I think are extremely the key issues that, that have driven this. Now, a little bit more in response to Peter Jung, and there's the Salai Martin question. Um, there's a whole, a whole debate, as you know, in the literature about the robustness of that, or you know, how many heroic assumptions that one has to make. Regardless of what you think about that, I think there are certain questions that are interesting about inequality within countries which need to be asked. Um, it's possible, I don't, I'm agnostic, it's possible that inequality is dropping, it's possible that it's rising, but I'm not sure it's, it's, that's the key area. I, if I do have a little bit of a, maybe a disagreement that the real concern is inequality because other people are more qualified. I'm sure that is, that is certainly a, a part of the, the equation, but I do not think that it, it applies as strongly as at least our cultural imagination says. I mean, I really like the picture that um, Jimmy Galbraith put up, which looked at US income inequality if you t took out the top five counties. That's not a story about uh, competition from abroad. It, and it's not a story about skill bias technical change. So I do feel like those stories, uh, my own sense is that may not be the, um, I don't know if that was what you're saying, but my own sense is that the real inequality, at least I heard you say that the real concern for inequality is concern about qualified people abroad competing. I'm not so sure about that anyway. Thank you. Okay, I have five quick points. 
The, the first one concerns data, and I think it, it's very important not to take data off the shelf in this area. One has to examine it very carefully because there are a lot of questions about the reliability and comparability of data sources uh, in doing cross-national comparisons in this area. Secondly, on your um, issues of the bias and so forth, the, my data sets are not US biased. US is one case, but the whole point of the exercise is to try and get a picture which goes beyond not only the US, but also the OECD, and in fact covers as much as possible of the entire world. Within the US case, real estate prices are important, particularly in the most recent period, but not, not, they're not the dominant force over the whole 30 or 40 years. Uh, institutions, of course, are very important. I said that at the beginning. Um, I do have a slightly different take on China. Very interesting argument in Michael's paper, but I would point to the deregulation of the current account in China in October of 2002 as being something of a turning point. And one thing that may be going on in China is that capital is flowing in to take advantage of speculative opportunities, but disguised in the current account, through the current account window, in other words, so that you have a larger uh, reported surplus in the current account uh, than is in fact the case. Uh, and that would be true with uh, misinvoicing of exports and imports. And there is certainly evidence in the Chinese literature of policy concern with that phenomenon, yes. So that, I deal with that in the book here, actually. Say so what? I'd love the paper. Oh, yes, indeed, indeed. Um, the um, uh, fourth point uh, on Mr. Younger's points, uh, correlation versus, cause, versus causation within country and between country effects. What we are dealing with here are common patterns in the data. And it is possible to make, I think, fairly strong inferences about what can and cannot be the source of common patterns. If governments are making autonomous decisions about education, then you're not going to see a common movement in the world economy unless something is driving a common education policy. And you're certainly not going to see turning points that coincide with cha major changes in the financial regime. But that's what you do observe. And that is what drives me to a statement about the likely causes of the forces observed in the measurements that we're taking. Uh, can the real cause be in large competition with the rest of the world asymmetric effects? No, it can't be, because if it were, then you would have opposite movements in the poor countries from the rich countries. This was Adrian Wood's thesis in his very good book in 1994, but it not, does not hold up uh, in the measurements of what goes on between uh, the, the uh, developing countries, industrializing countries, and the industrialized countries. Finally, Tom's point, I thoroughly agreed, this financial deregulation is the fundamental force in the United States in particular. You see it in, of course, the, the, the first wave is the information technology boom, and then you see this extraordinarily abusive cycle of credit expansion, uh, which uh, comes to a peak in 2007 and collapses in 2008, 2009. This is an extraordinary story of a financial sector run amok. There is a vast literature on the abusiveness and the fraud associated with this. I would just differ from a methodological perspective with some of my colleagues here in not seeing the banking se sector so much as an intermediary, therefore transferring funds from the 1% to the rest, but as the originator in this process. Yeah, it's absolutely the originator, uh, and uh, we're going to pay the consequences of, the, of allowing this to happen for many decades into the future. Thank you. We don't have time for another round of questions. I was asked by the organizer to end at 1.10. Now it's 1.13, so I, did, we did, I think we did quite well. I would like to thank the panel. My three take-home points are, one, we agree on the phenomenon. Second, we have to do work on the causes of the phenomenon. And third, institutions might matter much more than people tended to think, but that's my three take-home points. You might have different ones. I thank you for your attention and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much.